Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, your toaster finds peace. Doesn't that sound nice? It sounds pretty good, Seth. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson. And as always, I am here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Pete. Yeah. It's just time for a refresher. I love this. I actually love this. We have been talking so much about all the different relationship things and the the strategy and financials and all these kinds of, of things for this purportedly divorce legal podcast. It's been a long time since we've gotten back to basics. Yeah, and I think that's what today's about. And it really comes about because there is so much coming at people when they're going through this divorce. And we deal with it on the show. Every week we talk about it. Obviously, I deal with it daily at work. And it always takes a reminder to say, let's slow down. Let's talk about the legal process and the substantive issues that people will be dealing with and make sure that they understand where they are in the outline. And being able to break it down into an outline and make something that is truly a seamless web more linear can be very helpful for clients and everyone listening or going through a divorce. Well, and that's that brings us to this acronym. When do you came, this acronym PEACE, P-E-A-C-E, you're going to walk through the acronym and help everybody understand what it represents. When did you come up with it? How did you put this together? Oh, I didn't, I, I don't get ownership in that. I wish I could. This wasn't yours? It's been around for a long time. I think the first time I heard it was the first year that I was practicing family law and it was at a conference and it was actually named PEACE for that year. <laughs> like they, they were kind of doing a refresher because at the time a statute had changed and it touched a lot of stuff. So let's just start at the beginning. Peace, P-E-A-C-E. That is the outline for the five potential issues in any divorce case. They will also apply, some of them will apply to paternity cases, and I'll go through that. And some of it, the last E applies to post-judgment cases. So depending on where you are, you're going through a divorce or it's a paternity case or you're already divorced or your paternity case is over, but you have post-judgment issues, things aren't going well, we'll cover where that falls in the outline as well. So P is a parenting plan. The first D is equitable distribution. A is alimony. C is child support. In the second E is everything else. You always need that catch-all. That seems like a big bucket. It's a big bucket, but you you really get stuck in kind of the first four. Those are the big, those are the tough ones. Yeah. All right. Now, listen, we get questions from all over the country. We got downloads worldwide. These are the concepts of a divorce case. This is not necessarily what it's called in every state or every jurisdiction. So there will be nuances in just the way they approach it is different. So mainly, all my examples today are going to be Florida family law. But if you're going through any of this, check with your lawyer and try to ask them if this is the outline, because it will help the communication between the lawyer and the client much better. And when you're talking to your friends and they're going all over about it to your family and your family says, well, why don't you get this? Or I heard a friend get that. You can bring the conversation back to the outline to kind of practice and teach yourself, which gives you more ownership in the process. Yeah, agency for sure. Exactly. Okay, parenting plan. In Florida, there are three parts that I've come up with in a parenting plan. The first one is parental responsibility. The second is time sharing. And the third is all the other stuff that goes along with raising kids. <laughs> everything else. Again, that's the big it's bucket. It's nested everything else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> everything else within everything else. Yeah, right. <laughs> you right. know, re refer to three little I sub C, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's just mean. So parental responsibility in Florida is who and how are decisions made for the children. When you're married, 
you guys talk about it and okay, I don't want this preschool. I want that preschool. And ultimately you come to a decision and and it's done. Yes. I know someone out there is listening. is like, I never get to make any of the decisions. My spouse does. I hear you, but ultimately the decision was made. Okay. So in Florida, you have shared parental responsibility and then you have sole parental responsibility, or it's called sole decision-making, okay? And then you have something called ultimate decision-making, but it is shared. Then you have ultimate, I should put that second, because it's kind of a subset of shared, and then you have sole. So shared is any major decisions that need to be made for the child or children have to be made together. So what constitutes a major decision? Education, where the kids go to school. Health care. Those are the big ones. People are like, well, what about extracurriculars? It's actually not a major decision. It is a decision that if you want to sign your kid up for soccer and you go on your days and dad doesn't agree and then dad doesn't have to pay and you pay, but then dad signs the kid up for Taekwondo on his days and you don't agree and he pays. It's not the best for the kid because what happens is the kid misses soccer practice due to no fault time. of his own. Yeah. And then he doesn't get to play on the weekend game or he misses the weekend game every other weekend because he's going to Taekwondo. Right. So you try to work it out. Okay. But big decisions, health care. Yeah, this is, it seems like this gets into, you know, ideological stuff, right? Like parents have different belief systems as they split about how the child should be cared for. Not only belief systems, but what about a kid, Pete, that has ADHD? Do we medicate the child? Do we not? That medication is not take an aspirin and make a headache go away. It's take it every day at the same time. And whether you're at mom's house or dad's. That's right. And as you know, you have to learn and the body changes and the doctors have to regulate how much you got to figure it out. Everybody's different. Well, that takes a lot of co-parenting, especially if one parent doesn't want to have the child on the medication. Because how can you ensure that the child takes the medication if, if the child's at dad's house for a week? Right? I mean, I've literally had to argue, judge, mom needs to see the kid every day at 4.30 for two minutes. Just to make that happen. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Then we get into also just, just so it's out there, vaccinations too, right? I know that's a, a controversial thing. Huge. Vaccinations is huge. Okay. And the problem with all of these major decisions, if you don't agree, is the default by nature is that the child is not given a vaccination, is not given the medication because they're not on it. it. You have to take a physical act, right? And there's a lot of kids with special needs and there's a lot of decisions to be made there. So it can be very difficult. So if you agree, great. If you don't, what happens? Well, if you can prove, very hard to do, that the decision a parent is making is detrimental to the child in Florida, then you can become the sole decision maker. So that is really hard to get detrimental decisions because they can get any freaking expert to come in and say, no, kid, it's not really ADHD, it's anxiety. And so the medicine you don't really need, you need to deal with the anxiety. It, right? So you always have an expert saying one thing or another. Okay. Or vaccinations are a crock. They don't help. They cause autism. Right. You'll find somebody to say that if you need to. Right. I want to make ultimate decision making because she wants to give our child a vaccination that's going to cause the kid to have autism. So you just you just dropped ultimate decision making after sole decision making. What's the difference between those two? So thank you for that. So ultimate is you have to talk to the parent, give them all the info. If you don't agree, you get to make the decision. Tie goes to the decision maker, to mom in this case. Sole decision making, you don't even have to talk to them. Okay. Now, this gets very nuanced, but I want to spend a little time here. You don't ever want to go to court and say, I want ultimate decision making. I'll talk to them about education, but I make the decision. And I'll talk to them about 
medical decisions and I'll make the decision and I'll talk to them about religion, though courts really don't like dealing with that, but I make the decision because ultimately if you're making the ultimate decision on everything, you erode shared parental responsibility and you're really at sole decision making. Okay, so it's a slippery slope there. So if you're asking for something, it's better to be narrow in your focus. Where I've gone to court and said, Judge, my client is looking for ultimate decision making on where the child goes to school for the next three years or for high school. That's it. Really constrain it. Yeah, that's it, Judge. I'm not talking ultimate decision making on education. I'm not talking about whether they need a tutor. Just this school. I'm not even saying I get to make the ultimate decision on which classes they are enrolled in in said school. I just need them in the school. Okay. So you really got to narrowly tailor that. Okay. Any questions or thoughts there before we uh, move on? Well, we're staying in parenting plan for a little bit, right? Because now we're going to need to talk about custody and visitation. Yeah. Which we call in Florida time sharing. Across the nation, it's called different things. This is what people mainly fight about at first. This is what they think about. Like, when am I going to see my kid? I want my kid more, right? And they'll have all these reasons why they should have the child more, which is basically I'm the better parent or the other parent's not involved. And I've done all the heavy lifting over all these years or the other parent doesn't know how to change a diaper, whatever the case may be. So. In Florida, let's get rid of a couple things right away. First off, there is a presumption now that we've discussed of 50-50 timesharing. That's the starting point. So when someone comes to me and says, the baby is six months old and he doesn't know how to change a diaper, I'm telling them and the judge is going to tell them you're about to learn. Okay. There is a common theme. When the kids are little, they should be with mom. And when they're four or five or six and they're in grade school, then they can start spending more time with dad. That is called the tender years doctrine. And that is abolished in Florida and has been for a long time. Check your local state and jurisdiction. I don't know what it is in Wyoming. Okay. So it starts with 50-50 time sharing. So how do you get away from that? There in Florida are 20 different factors that you have to look at. And the judge will say what is in the best interest of the child. The Easiest factor, in my view, to get something other than 50-50 that is not bashing the other parent is logistics. So if you have parents that are living geographically too far away from each other due to no fault of their own, this is where my job is, this is where your job is. And we have to pick a school that's close to one of us so someone has to make that decision and logistically it just don't doesn't work and you can show that your school is better your kids been in this school for a long time and to get the child up at 5 in the morning to get to school by 7:30 Cruel is and not unusual. in the child's right. yeah exactly yeah. now i did this little tip years and years ago when I was first practicing family law and they were complaining that my guy lived too far away and the child had to get up too early. I subpoenaed the school district for their bus schedules and my guy's drive was less than a kid being on the bus. Wow. And I said, judge doesn't work. Are you going to say any kid that has to take a bus should be with the other parent? Right. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. No, of course. Yeah. Of course. So, um, so there's a lot of different ways to prove this, right? As opposed to just saying, judge, 45 minutes isn't that long. It's an arbitrary number. Is 48 minutes good? Not good? Right? Right. Parental relativism can work in your favor here is what we're saying, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. But then, of course, in the statute, there are... a I'm not going to go through all 20 of them. We'll be here. We could just do a whole thing on parenting, which we've done. But I appreciate that. It is literally abuse, drugs and alcohol. Is the child old enough in sufficient age and maturity to have a preference? Be careful with that. No, nowhere in Florida law does it ever say the kid gets to decide. I get that question all the time. How old till my kid can decide what to do? I said 18. 18. Yeah. <laughs> right. But be careful with that 
one, when you bring your kid into court, you might not like what they say. They might be playing you, right? Two, there's another part of the statute that says, who shields the child from litigation? Did you bring him involved in the litigation? Were you talking about the litigation? That's not good for kids. I can't win on both. You want me to bring your kid in, you've now put your kid in the middle of litigation talking to the judge. I lose that factor. So that's the concept. But think about where your kid stays, 50-50 time sharing. Is it week on, week off? For younger kids, is it always with mom on Monday, Tuesday, dad on Wednesday, Thursday? Mom every other weekend, dad every other weekend. Or do you go Monday, Tuesday, mom, Wednesday, Thursday, dad, then mom gets the weekend, but then dad gets Monday, Tuesday, and dad gets Wednesday, Thursday, switch the weekend. And you know what, Pete, for our show notes, I'll put up some parenting plans. People can look at week on, week off. It's a two-week cycle. Very handy, yeah. And then this is where you come into um, holiday schedules. Sure. And we talked about this years ago that I had a special holiday that's not a Hallmark holiday, and it's called Hooky Day, and we'd play hooky from school and work and go to a spring training baseball game since we live in Florida. Yes. And I remember, Pete, and I did not use the AI bot to look this up, (laughs) to be clear. I remember what your special holiday was as a child. Yeah. Your father would come in on a big movie release and say, you don't feel so good, do you? Right? Absolutely. And he would have a little cough, too. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit like today that you have a little sick. I'm, I don't know if that, <laughs> if that was movie. it. <laughs> Is there a release today? I'm missing. <laughs> and you guys would go yeah. see a movie. Yeah. Right. Those are important days. And so, but other than that, you basically split holidays 50-50. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Week on, week off, or first half and second half, excuse me, of winter break. Whoever gets Christmas Eve, the other one gets Christmas Day, starting at noon or two, rotating over, or you just get Christmas Eve and Christmas Day every other year. Same with Thanksgiving. Whoever gets Thanksgiving, the other one gets Christmas Eve. The other the other parent that got Thanksgiving usually gets New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Oh my gosh. Uh, obviously, yeah, right. Mother's Day is going to go with mom. Father's Day is going to go with dad. If you have two mothers or two fathers and you don't want to split the day. One gets it one year, one gets it the other. So there's a lot of ways to do holidays. So these two things, right, talking about parental responsibility and and time sharing, custody and, and visitation, seem to me to be the stereotypical like pain points in the the relationship with your kids and the divorce process. And we still have this everything else. And I know everything else is going to be big, but can you give me some examples without, you know, going into all of them? Yeah, these are less pain points. That's a great, great point you make. This is like, how often do you get to communicate with your kid when with, they're with the other parent? Okay. All right. Is it a phone call every night? Is it text? You know, what do you do about if you have to work on a Saturday, but it's your Saturday? Do you give the right of first refusal to the other parent? Like, look, I have to travel for work. It's bad. But will you take them or do you want me to find somebody else? You got it. And listen, something as simple as that, that sounds so easy and kind. Like, look, it sucks. We both get half the time with our kid now. I'm unavailable. Why shouldn't they be with mom? Dad's unavailable. Or mom has to work. Why shouldn't they be with dad? Mom's unavailable. Same concept. It seems so easy to be like, hey, do you want the kid? But what happens is people just use it against each other. Well, where are you going? I don't have to tell you where I'm going. I'm just telling you I'm unavailable. I don't have to tell you I'm working. I'm offering time with your kid. Why are you asking me about my schedule? You know, but it becomes like a hide and seek, seek and find type of deal. People don't abide by it. Like, oh, he was gone for this long. I didn't get the call. I should have gotten the call. Like it, everything can be a problem. Okay. So those are the type of things extracurriculars we talked about that would be part of everything else that can be a bit of a pain point sometimes what about sick days what about sick days kiddo sick oh yeah this is a pet peeve so for you or the parents or the kid for me on how it's drafted in agreements oh okay <laughs> so here's the selfish move when you're a parent co-parenting you wake up your kid's sick It's an exchange day. You drop your kid off at school. And then by first or second period, 
Someone's getting a phone call. Kid's sick. Come pick him up. Oh. Now, mom, let's say you're the dad. Mom has to go pick up the kid because it's her evening. Oh, that's sly. You can totally jam them up. This is what people do to each other. Oh, people are the worst. So I like to draft my agreements that say the exchange time is at the end of school. So if the call comes in, it goes to the parent who was on duty in the morning. That's right. It eliminates that problem. Yeah. Of sticking it to them. Oh. Okay. And I'm just telling you all the shit I pulled on my former spouse when <laughs> Kai was little. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, so I get that. That's good. That's P for parenting. We're 20 minutes in. We haven't even done a- another letter. I know. But that's always a big one. Okay. Equitable distribution. Equitable distribution. How are you even going to begin to talk about this without a spreadsheet? I know. My love language. <laughs> it's hard, but I'll try because <laughs> okay. I have my spreadsheets memorized. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. We're going to start at cell 427B. <laughs> oh, no. no. Close your eyes. It's a guided <laughs> spreadsheet meditation. You're going to love it. Okay. Equitable distribution. This is the division of assets and debts. Assets, as we all know, are things that you own. Debts, liabilities, are things that you owe to people, usually cash. And how will they be divided? In Florida, this is what you should be doing. Start with identification. Get a list of everything that you own in your name alone, everything that you own jointly with your spouse, and everything that you own with any third party or entity. If you own an office building and it's in an LLC and you have other members part of the LLC, that's what I mean by third party or entity. You're on a bank account with your elderly parent. That needs to be listed. Your owner of it, It might not be a marital asset to divide, but your name is on it. So you got to disclose it. Okay. Identification. Then you do classification. Is this item marital or non-marital? If it's marital, when you get to distribution, the other party is entitled to half the value. And when you get to distribution, if it's a marital credit card debt, half the debt is the responsible of the other party, okay? If it is non-marital, let's take something easy. Student loans in Florida before you got married, that's debt that you accumulated before marriage, you get divorced, your ex-spouse does not have to pay half of your student loan back. You're responsible for it. Question? Yeah. Bank account question. Bank and credit card. When you get divorced, this is this might be a inane question. When you get divorced, do you go to your, let's say you have $10,000 against you on the credit card at that given point. Do you go to the credit card and say, hey, uh, American Express, uh, we're getting a divorce. I need you to set up a second account that splits the debt that we owe and we'll both start paying. Or do you just keep paying toward the marital account until it's gone? Credit cards usually won't do that. You can try but that's putting the decision in the third party that you don't control. Credit cards inevitably have a account holder and a secondary. The account holder is the primary. That's right. If my client is the primary, I'm always having them take that debt because I don't trust the other guy to pay it. But to your point, everyone's going to be like, this is a joint card. We both use it or joint bank account. Who gets it? The bank is easy. You can go and close the account and someone gets half, right? Debts are harder. So identification, classification, marital versus non-marital, then valuation. How much is it worth? Some things are very easy to value. A bank statement, 10 grand in your hypothetical. Has a dollar value on it. Yeah. Right. Right. Pretty easy. Yeah. Cars, a little harder, but not much. You can take it to CarMax and get a quote to buy your car. Good for seven days. You can go to Kelly Blue Book. Houses, a little harder. Appraisals. Market analysis. Comps, sure. Comps. You can just sell it. That will tell us the market, right? Boats, same kind of thing, okay? Closely held businesses. What is my law firm worth? Yeah. Harder to value, right? How much of my law firm in Florida is my personal goodwill? People are calling for me, Seth Nelson, versus one of the other partners or associates. Personal goodwill in Florida is not a marital asset. So if my law firm is worth $1,000, but the personal goodwill is 80% or 800 bucks, my spouse is only entitled to 100 bucks because 200 is marital. I get half and she gets half. 
So that's how equitable distribution works. Now, non-marital ring, engagement ring, gift before marriage, it's hers. Wedding band, first gift given to each other while you're married, marital property. Really? Gifts between spouses during the marriage is marital property. So in the great state of Florida, wow. you cannot give your spouse a full gift because if you get divorced, you get half that half shit back. back. Wow. Right? Well, that gets the wheels turning. I mean, I'm happily married, but, you know, she's got a lot of good stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking she does not want your old iPod no. <laughs> that's on your wall back there, right? <laughs> so, absolutely. And if you think about it, at one hand, you're like, seriously? Yeah. It was a gift. On the other hand, the judges don't want to get into an argument. Was it a gift? Was it not? Right? Right. right. What about joint gifts that you got for your wedding? That gets split. Split. So. What about, uh, okay, I, I don't want to nickel and dime this all day with whatabouts, but I have, I have one, which is, okay, an inheritance of family property, class, uh, antique furniture, something like that, that came to you from one or the other set of parents of, uh, you know, into the family. Well, I'm going to answer inheritance of property like you've described. I'm going to talk about inheritance of cash. Okay. Anything inheritance is a gift to one spouse, right? If it says this antique table goes to my son, Pete, that's a gift to you. That's a gift from a third party to you. That is non-marital. Pete, when I give you a birthday gift, that is a non-marital gift to you. Your wife doesn't get half of it upon divorce. I gave it to you. But if, if, the, I give if it you came an, to Pete and Kira... That, like your anniversary gift that I sent you last year. Yeah, I'm still looking for that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, yeah. United States Postal Service. Yeah, so, But I give you that gift for your anniversary to both of you, marital property. Marital property. So a, a grandparents pass down an antique table to Pete and Kira, marital property, the value of that gets either, it either gets split or sold. That's right. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, now you inherit cash. You keep it in a bank account, all your name, on your own, and you just let it grow and grow and grow. You don't touch it. Non-marital property. It's in an account by your name, alone. You've never commingled it with any marital money. You set it aside. You take that account and you deposit it into your joint checking account, or you deposit it into an account with your name only on it, but you've put marital money into that account from your earnings, from all the money you're banking on the podcast. Yeah, right. Right? You've commingled it. You've converted a non marital money to marital. And you didn't even know it. Exactly. That's sneaky. When you pay off your student loans of your spouse, you're taking marital money or non marital money of your own and you're paying off non marital debt. Okay. All right. Okay. The sheet never matches at the end because you try to like divide up who gets the house and how do you pay off the mortgage. You do all that. And if it equals at the bottom or is equitable, fair. Then we're good. If someone owes someone some money, then you got to figure out how it's going to get paid. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, and we should say, we should say specifically, it either gets paid in what, a cash payment or a sale of property to equalize. That's right. Those columns. Okay. That's right. All right. Okay. So now we're on A, alimony. Pete, as you know, alimony is the payment from one spouse to the other, either during the divorce process, temporary alimony, or after divorce. And there's different types in different jurisdictions. That's what alimony is. We all know. Yep. Somebody's paying somebody. Somebody's paying somebody else. The question is how much and how long and how do you determine it? So how much in Florida is defined by the lesser of the lesser of the following two numbers? What is the need of one spouse and the ability of the other spouse to pay? So someone has a job, they're making $5,000 a month. After taxes, net, their expenses are $7,000 a month. We all agree that everything's legit. That person's short two grand a month. That is the most in Florida that that spouse on the other side of the equation will pay. Assuming that they're making 10 grand and their expenses are only eight. 
if they can put away two grand in savings, two grand in their retirement every month, they have enough to pay the alimony. Or 35% the difference of the net incomes. It, it, that that means what? If the difference is much bigger, it's essentially 35% is a soft cap? Yep. So if the need is $20,000 a month, and we all agree that's the need, but the difference in their net incomes is 35%, and that 35% is $11,000 a month, that's the cap. There's a little asterisk, though. Because what happens if the person wants rehabilitative alimony to go back to school for four years? You can get the 11 grand at 35% and then you can get the other person to pay for school. So you can get over 35. It's a brand new statute in January 2023. It has not been litigated much. There's a lot of questions to it, but we're moving forward with that. So that's in Florida law. Check your local jurisdiction. Check your local jurisdiction. But the concepts are the same. Need, ability to pay. Now, how long? In Florida, there's different gaps. I'm just going to go through them generally, not specific, because people are listening nationwide. But less than, ten, less than three years, it's basically, don't even worry about it. There's some there, but don't worry about it much. Less than 10 years, but more than three, you can get half the length of the marriage. 10 to 20 years, you can get 60% the length of the marriage. Over 20 years, you can get up to 75% the length of the marriage. Okay. okay. All right. That's neat. That actually is the first time you've said anything that actually kind of seems easy. Yeah. Well, it's easy to say, oh, I've been married for 20 years and do the math. But then the statute says, that's the most. And the person paying is allowed to retire. And what about this? And what about that? And it says that the spouse that's getting it might be able to get more money in the future because they're earnings, even though they're back in the workforce, are going to go up. So maybe you should limit the time. It's There's a lot in there. A lot in there, yeah. R- right. Okay. Child support. Right. Alimony, to be clear, for people who are like I was, is just what they pay to each other has nothing to do with children. That's correct. Child support is specifically for the care of the child. That is correct. Okay. But in Florida, it doesn't say exactly what you need to spend it on. Okay. It's a mathematical formula. They don't want to talk about where is the money going. In rare cases, you can, which we'll talk about briefly. But a couple things you should know, hopefully, at the beginning of your case in the child support calculation, because here are the inputs. How many kids? That should be an easy one. I hope you know that. Right. That should be an easy one. Then, ready for this, the number of overnights that each parent gets. We don't know that till we finish the parenting plan. Then what are their net incomes? We don't know that until we've done equitable distribution and alimony. And here's why. In equitable distribution, if you are given in the schedule a rental property that's producing income, that's part of the analysis for your alimony. If you're given a bank account with a million dollars in it, and you can get 5% interest off the million, that's $50,000 in income. So I can't do child support till I know your income. I can't do income till I know equitable distribution. Yeah, a philosophical question. In the spirit of the logic that, you know, you always put your mask on before you affix the mask to your child on on a crashing plane, why is child support after alimony. You know, in the spirit of always put kids first, we're not doing that. Great question. Because child support input starts at the parents' net incomes. That's one of them, their net incomes. So alimony, when a spouse pays the two grand in alimony, that will, for child support purposes in Florida, if they have 10 grand and they pay two, their net income is only eight thousand dollars, not ten. The other spouse that received the two grand, let's say they were making five thousand dollars net, they received two. Now they're at seven. Okay, so you have a spouse at seven and a spouse at eight. That's right. Now that two thousand dollar payment, where I just said changes their income, does not change their income for federal tax purposes. This is only a child support calculation. Okay. Okay. 
So they're still claiming 5,000. They're claiming 5,000 on the one, and the other one is saying, I was making 10. Okay? So you pay child support and alimony with after-tax dollars. Okay. So now you get their net incomes, and that's where the child support calculation starts. What are your net incomes? That's why you can't do it till after alimony and after equitable distribution. All right. So we have our seven and eight. Boom. It all gets popped. There's a couple others, which I won't bore you with. Check your local jurisdiction. It spits out a number. Pete, I've been doing this a long time. No one has ever argued that two plus two doesn't equal four. If that was the child support formula, they argue the first two should be a 10 and the second two should be a five and the child support should be 15, not four. You argue over the inputs, not the formula. That makes sense to me. I can see getting riled up about that. Yep. Yep. Oh, they're hiding money. They have more money. They get, they're a yard guy and they're running the business, but they get paid cash. And I'm like, no, they don't. And my client says, yes, they do. And I say, no, they don't. And they say, yes, they do. And I said, no one uses cash. Let's go check his Zell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've actually been able to track more money now that there's the cash apps. Zell and Venmo and sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I gave a 25 year old adult child of mine a hundred dollars in cash. And she said to me, I don't know what to do with cash. And I said, I do. Do you want me to take it back? <laughs> uh-huh. I have some ideas. <laughs> okay. Everything else, the divorce process, attorney's fees, costs. How do we get from A to B? That's the big catch all. And this is the catch all for post judgment cases. If you come to me and you're already divorced, my analysis will be different than you're getting divorced the first time because you're in a different stage of the process. So understanding where you are in the process, what are the next steps, and what are your ultimate goals, and whether your goals in your life match what the law is saying is really important to understand. I get more questions from my client. What's next? Where are we? And frankly, we can always improve. I need to slow down and tell my clients, here's where we are. Here's our goal. This is the next step. We are not at step five, six, seven, eight. And we, we've we create now litigation plans. We're like checklists on here's what's coming next. It's not the goal to litigate it. And at any time, my litigation plans, the remaining 27 lists on things on this item, on this list can go away if we settle. I, I mean, how often do you find your counsel is to litigate? Like, is there a trigger point or are there red flags that you're looking for where you think, okay, this is definitely going to go to court? Well, there's some cases I know are going to court. If someone wants to move across the country on a relocation, post-judgment, already divorced, they want to move because they got a job offer, that's going to trial. It's going to court, yeah. Right. And I find out fairly early on in cases whether it's going to end up really being litigated to either force a settlement or end up in trial based on the positions and how much information we're getting back and forth. I try to get offers out fairly early once I have all the information. Now, on child parenting issues, I can get a parenting plan out in the first couple weeks if my client's going to come in and sit down and tell me the truth about what's going on with the kid and the other parent. We have all the information we need. If a kid has some mental health issues or something we have to dig into, that's a problem. Maybe we need more information. So, well, very useful, Seth. This is a good reset. This is, a, you know, what this reset. is. This is a great start here episode. We've got a lot of episodes in the queue now. I think if, you know we should we should probably put a big flag on this. It says start here. This is how to. This is the how to divorce. That's right. That's the just the outline of where you are in the process and some sub, substantive issues. Peace, peace, peace. This is really useful. Thank you, Seth, as always, and thank you everyone for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate your time and your attention. Uh, don't forget to send us those questions, how to split a toaster.com. Any questions about the divorce process now that you've gotten through this episode, please head over to how to split a toaster.com and submit your question, and we will get it answered on an upcoming episode. On behalf of Seth Nelson, America's favorite divorce attorney, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next time right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. 
How to Split a Toaster is part of the True Story FM podcast network, produced by Andy Nelson, music by T. Bless and the Professionals, and DB Studios. Seth Nelson is an attorney with NLG Divorce and Family Law with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of NLG Divorce and Family Law. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.